Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Israel Resilience Fund launch webinar. We are from our crowd, and I wanted to introduce, first of all, myself. I'm Kaylee Chill. I'm a partner here at our crowd, head of investment funds and the chief legal officer. And with me today are John Medved, our CEO and founder, Bruce Tarragon from Blumberg Capital, and Izar Shai, former minister of um, science and technology, an Israeli minister and he's with Canaan Partners. And what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be talking about a special fund that we've put together, basically to respond in the our crowd way to what's happening in Israel over the past several weeks. Everybody's talking about resilience, resilience of a nation, resilience uh, getting through uh, a very difficult time. And what our crowd is doing right now is putting resilience into the high-tech ecosystem. We're putting together a fund, the idea of which is to bring more capital to startups that are in trouble during a time that, as it was, wasn't easy, even before the war broke out on October 7th, uh, but right now going through even a more difficult period. The idea is to bring as much capital up to $50 million, which is what we are striving for. And on this webinar, we're going to talk about how we're going to do that, why it's so important, and the amazing group of people that have come together to help us with this important goal. With that, I'd like to turn it over to John Medved. Thank you, Kaylee. And uh, when she, yeah, it's great. And uh, thank you all for being here with us. It's my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Yizhar Shai, to kick it off. Uh, Yizhar uh, was the CEO of a company I backed called Business Layers couple of decades ago. Uh, doesn't seem that long ago, Yishar. And that company was bought by Nitegrity, which was acquired by uh, CA. He then went on to have a great career as a serial entrepreneur, as a well-known venture capitalist, opening up the Canaan Partners office in Israel, and ultimately becoming an elected member of parliament and being appointed to the uh, Minister of uh, Science and Technology. Yizhar is a well-known figure in this country and a, a dear friend. Unfortunately, he lost his uh, son, hero son, uh, Yaron, who was uh, engaged in unbelievable heroic defense of uh, a village in the south of Israel on October 7th. Yizhar Shai, please uh, talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. And uh, good evening, good afternoon. To, to the people who are watching us uh, today. Thank you, uh, John and our crowd for the opportunity uh, to speak and to promote the Israeli innovation scene in front of investors around the world. As John mentioned, I am the proud father of Yaron Ori Shai, who died while defending civilians with his, uh, uh, his friends, a band of brothers of 30 plus heroes who stood uh, uh, for a full day of combat against hundreds of uh, Hamas terrorists and accomplished their mission of protecting Israeli civilians. The valor and the heroism uh, are documented that will be uh, spoken for in years to come. And I'm very proud to have been uh, the father of such a fine young Israeli uh, kid and soldier. Uh, but I do want to speak about innovation today and about what we are facing. Israel, as, uh, as we all know, startup nation, and as such, we know that we have to uh, keep going. And the current challenges that we are facing, we have to stay at the backdrop for a new generation of uh, numerous companies that will be established in the near foreseen future. We have set a goal to ourselves, which is for every fallen soldier, for every young baby that was uh, brutally murdered, for every young family, women, elderly, for anybody who lost their lives in this war that was imposed on us on October 7th. And we count now about 1,400 people that have lost their lives. For each and one of them, we are going to put together a new innovative startup company. And this startup company will be formed by talented Israeli entrepreneurs 
as it was the case with many thousands of companies here in the past. We know that the talent is there. We know that the motivation for entrepreneurship is even stronger than ever. Believe me, I am speaking today, these days, with entrepreneurs who already have come up, uh, come up with the wonderful, unbelievable ideas. Most of them, by the way, totally unrelated to this war. People have ideas that go to solve problems of uh, agricultural challenges, of medical situations, of um, you know financial problems that uh, have to be solved, and so on and so forth. All of this innovation has to be merged into about 1,400 startups that will be the new generation of Israeli innovative companies, and they have to be funded by investors who believe in the Israeli high tech scene and the Israeli innovation. I'm not seeking donations. I'm calling and encouraging investments in excellent entrepreneurs, excellent ideas, and excellent business propositions. Uh, we are building a large database of those companies, and we know that along with the existing, already existing companies that are already there, that have been funded here over the last few years, this is a very strong infrastructure of the next generation of the Israeli innovation. Um, we are building programs for these startup companies to be um, mentored by experts from Israel and from around um, or around the world. We are building programs that make sure that there is a connection between this new generation of companies and uh, the, the people that they represent, each and one of the fallen soldiers who murdered civilians. And we know that along with the existing generation of uh, uh, innovative companies, we will do the right thing and uh, promote uh, this innovation into, uh, into the whole world. I want just to mention to you investors that I believe that there is a twofold motivation here. The first and foremost should be a business motivation. You want to invest in Israeli technology, young or early stage or mid stage or late stage, but you want to invest in Israeli uh, innovation because you want to make money. And historically we have provided very good returns to investors, by the way, most of them international investors. Um, so that would be motivation number one. The second motivation that comes along here, we are doing the right thing. This is, uh, you could compare this to impact investments. You do not only want to make money, you also want to make your investment to provide for a better world. This is definitely what we are doing here. Our response to destruction and atrocities and inhumanity, our response is building and innovating and providing solutions and opportunities for a better world. This is the right response to evil. This is the right response that we are going to build here, which will affect the whole world. As we all know, Israeli innovation is sold and promoted outside of Israel. We're a small market here. The world is big and wide to, to kind of um, consume the technologies that will be coming from here and the solutions and the products. And so the right answer to the evil that uh, attacked not only Israel, but the Western world values, cultures, and, um, and system, the right answer is building, rebuilding, and providing for a new, better world. Um, I think I should stop here, John. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Yisar. And uh, all of our thoughts are with you and your family. Uh, you just, yesterday, I think, had the Shloshim. Uh, you know, it's 30 days since people fell in this, uh, you know, terrible attack on October 7th. Um, the stories of the heroism of people like your son and the, the, those who fell are stunning. I think people from outside of Israel ask the question, where do you get this heroism from? What, what, do, you, what do you feed these kids as children? How do you raise them? Where does this come from? Where, where does the resilience that everyone talks about, about Israel, which takes such a blow and then gets up and, you know, continues on and creates? Where does this come from? What's in the culture? Thank you. There must be something in the food, I guess. But other than that, you know, um, Yaron comes from a family, a family whose, uh, you know, grandparents uh, were part of the generation who put together this nation. 
Um, his parents, myself and my wife, uh, did what we could in order to provide for a better uh, infrastructure, a better country, both as, uh, as soldiers and officers, but also as people who educated their kids to give back to community. Um, and Yaron was, uh, he did not consider himself a special person, but I should say that uh, he was a combination. Yaron was born in the U.S. and was an Israeli-American citizen. His education in early in his early age of, you know, until about five years old was in the U.S. And then in Israel, he went uh, in high school for four years into the American school here in Israel. And his, I should say, his system was programmed by the combination of American and Israeli values. Both of uh, uh, you know, both of those sets of values co combine into, uh, I believe, the right values that any kid should uh, be educated and grow upon. You know, freedom, the freedom of choice, responsibility, the responsibility to not only provide for yourself but also to give back to the community. And uh, this is the system that brought him to a decision to make whatever he could in order to give back. You know, as a kid in high school, he volunteered in a youth movement. He took a gap year between high school and his military service to work with a socially challenged, uh, economically background kids uh, in the south of Tel Aviv. And then in the army, he tried to do his best and uh, volunteered to a very special unit and had to work very hard in order to, to draft into that unit. So, you know, you grow up these kids, first of all, with a lot of love and uh, a lot of freedom to go about their choices, but also uh, really based on the values that we all should, and I guess grew up uh, uh, you know, on, which is the American-Israeli uh, system of, uh, of values, and I truly believe in this. Thank, thank you, Yisar. I really appreciate your presence. I know you have a family event to get to, so we're gonna let you go. But uh, again, thank you. When we are going to dedicate ourselves to planting those 1,400 companies that will bring goodness to the world. Thank you very much, Yisar Shai. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, you know, kudos, our crowd. I have seen you growing from an idea on a napkin. John and I have been, had this uh, meeting many years ago, and it is wonderful to see uh, you know, the success and the, the outreach and everything that you've been doing here. Thank you very much, John. And Everybody down front. Thank you. So with those opening comments, which I think are appropriate given the, this fund, I want to introduce you all to the Resilience Fund. Um, this is a unique product that was born literally the, the day that, uh, that the war uh, broke out. We sat around as a team and said, what can we do? And now you're disclaimed to help. There is a crisis here. Uh, we're busy fighting a war of, of uh, great challenge. And we have an incredible ecosystem that needs support. Uh, we're starting with 50 million. We would be delighted to go up to 75 or 100 million. We're going to invest approximately a half a million to about a million dollars, maybe a little more in select cases in 50 plus companies. Um, what's making this interesting is that we are not charging management fees nor carried interest in this fund. We're doing this as a project of our crowd to get this money into the ecosystem as quickly as possible. And we're taking a pledge to deploy the money within no later than six months, and I hope a lot quicker than that. Uh, we're focusing on those companies that have already demonstrated uh, promise and progress but who need what's called runway extension. They need the ability to be able to extend their runway to a 12 month or 15 month, get to the bigger round. We're also taking advantage of discounted valuations because prices are low. And we think this is a particularly interesting entry point. We'll show you data on that in a second for investors to come in to the ecosystem. In addition, we're going to um, essentially look for the impact of being sort of a snowball core where we will create all kinds of matching and our half a million dollars will grow to be a two million or more. 
So if you look at how important Israel's tech economy is, uh, it's really almost more important here than almost anywhere else in the world. Uh, at the moment, over 50% of Israel's exports come from tech, 18% uh, of our GDP, 14% of our workforce. Uh, the, a number of blows my mind is $50 billion invested here uh, over the last three years in uh, startups, which is an incredible number. Um, and our economic stability depends on the strength of our startup ecosystem, okay? And we were having issues, as everybody was, before the war. The war has complicated matters, except that Israeli startups are resilient. Our ability to actually continue growing and handle crises is well uh, documented and, and proven in, in past struggles. But we now need to step it up and to provide this kind of uh, uh, funding to those promising companies that really are, are, are on the cusp of breaking out, but need a little bit longer runway. So if you, you know, notice what happened to the venture capital market uh, over the 21, 22 time period is it really went down very, very significantly in terms of funding activity. A 50% drop around the world, 60% here. There was things starting to stabilize in the second half of 2023. We certainly saw that in our crowd, but now the war hits and it's very hard for people in the middle of a war to uh, step in unless they're committed and understand that this actually is a great entry place and that in order to support Israel and our ecosystem, the time is now. So that's why we put together you know, this uh, in, important fund as a first effort. And we're getting what, what is really wonderful is support from venture capitalists across the board. This is not our crowd. This is the Israeli ecosystem. We're just an agent of that. And that's why we've got people like Bruce and. Yizhar from Disruptive uh, uh, VC and others who are here with us. Um, you can look at timing and you'll see in this uh, slide that in the past, when Israel has gone to war, and these are the five pre previous Israel-Hamas clashes, the stock market goes down. This is the TA-35 uh, index, almost immediately, typically 10 to 20%, and then starts a steady climb which not only comes back to where it was, but usually overshoots by an average of 20 or 30%. It's quite, uh, it's actually, if you look and study these, these uh, uh, charts, you'll see that it happens more than once. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna invest in companies that are uh, according to a couple of criteria. Number one, we have companies that are literally on the border. We have companies that are located in Sterot, one kilometer from the border. We have companies that are located in Kiryat Shmona, where the neighborhood was terribly uh, attacked last night with rocket fire from Lebanon. We're going to focus on companies that are up in the danger zones where they can use this money to rebuild and to, and to gain traction earlier. We're going to look at companies that are developing critical solutions and are playing a role in the crisis what we call dual use companies, such as those, uh, I give examples like Emprest and others who have both the software that powers, powers the Iron Dome and software that powers the Iron Grid and the future of you know, next generation energy networks. We're gonna focus on companies with short runways, meaning typically the companies we'll be investing in will have before our money less than six months of runway available. And in order to help them complete a fundraising round and get that extension of the runway to at least a year, that's where we step in with our money and act as a catalyst. And we're going to be able to actually deploy this money quickly uh, over a couple of month period during the war when these companies need this support right now. Now, again, we're looking for the criteria. The criteria are impacted by the war. 
short runways, already a proven product market fit with uh, uh, initial sales or traction, design wins, proof of concepts, or revenues. And there are companies that are not just seed ideas, but companies that have already received at least a million dollars of, pri of prior funding rounds. We intend to be not the only fund stepping up. We intend to be a catalyst and have matching funding going on. So we expect to be between 10 to 50% of the total round size. We're gonna focus on these series A and B companies. And we're going to do either uh, externally priced rounds, especially if it's in one of our companies, or we're going to do what are called CLAs or SAFEs, which are convertible instruments that'll be priced at a discount to the next round, typically with a cap. And our fund capital will be deployed quickly over the uh, maximum period of six months, providing vital financial resources. By the way, we've got an enormous number of questions, which I'm anxious to get to, but I'll uh, make my comments quickly and then we'll get Bruce on and we'll get to your questions. So please stand by. Um, you can see that basically difficult financial moments happen to be great venture vintages. And when you look, and by the way, it's vintages and everything, but venture is particularly uh, uh, aligned with this. And when you have a period of a recession or some kind of economic downturn, that's a great time to invest in venture capital. And when you want to look at some of these companies, and someone asked, we have a list of the companies that we're already looking at. These are some of them. And we're actually preparing, as we speak, a lot of this is going on in real time, as you can imagine. Uh, we're preparing a list of, I think, 30 companies that will be ready by tomorrow, which we'll be able to share with people if you're in touch with me at John at our crowd, or with your, better yet, your R crowd rep, will probably get back to you faster than I will, although my team is trying really hard. Um, but these are companies that I think give you an indication of some of the uh, elements of our strategy. Mpressed, again, is the company which is most famous for its software, which is the command and control for the Iron Dome, except they've now developed incredible software, which is getting great traction for the Iron Grid to help next generation energy networks work, prevent fires, to uh, help manage renewables and whatnot. And uh, literally, we're actually raising money for Empress right now on our platform. And God willing, with this uh, resilience fund, we'll take a, a bigger piece of that. Edgy Bees is providing incredible, uh, essentially, it's, it's visual software that helps align aerial, both drone and satellite imagery. Now, you can imagine that that has implications for uh, military, and they do, both here and abroad, but they also have tremendous applications for all kinds of critical infrastructure, energy, all kinds of people are using this software. Company's doing well, but it needs a, a, you know, an extension. Cyabra, which is the leading company today in Israel fighting fake news and bots, especially the 100,000 out of Iran. These guys, their revenue is growing fast, but they are raising money and they need to extend their runway. And the company is uh, quite remarkable. Fresh Start is our incubator in Kiryat Shmona. We have an incubator there with uh, a dozen companies in the food tech area. And they've all had to relocate because of the, uh, the bombing and the, uh, uh, the shelling of Kiryat Shmona and they need our support. Karar is in one of our two companies in Stero. They have an amazing technology that gives you thermal management of uh, EVs. They have a unique cooling technology and uh, they are literally right on the border. It's led by a great CEO, Avi Noam Rubenstein, and we're very excited about that company raising for it now. Bionic Hive is another company where we're co-invested with Amazon literally right on the border of Sterot, and they make robotic uh, warehouse uh, machines 
that work in a hybrid warehouse where it's not all robotic, but there are humans involved in well as well. These are just some of the examples of the companies we'll be looking at in this fund. Now, we I want to mention that in prior downturns, that's when great companies are born. Turns out that the crucible of challenge and crisis gives birth to great companies. Here you can see a, a couple of them. Why are we doing it? Well, we're Israel's most active venture investor. Okay, we've been named that way by PitchBook since 2013. We've invested in 240 Israeli companies, including 50 pre-seed startups from the north to the south. We have a digital platform which is scalable and can handle this deployment of capital in an effective and speedy manner. And we have you. The fact that we are working with this incredible group of 230,000 accredited investors all over the world gives us the ability to be a force multiplier to not only help raise money once and again and again, but also to make added value contributions to these companies' progress, whether it's critical introductions, providing additional funding, helping people to build their management teams, figuring out who can sit on their boards. And we welcome, especially for this fund, your involvement as always. We are going to be the snowball effect catalyst. We're going to put in a relatively initial amount of money. It's going to get matched by the government. It's then going to be matched again by additional pools of capital in the R crowd platform, such as the OC50, such as our food tech fund, if it's a food tech company, such as a cyber fund. And we hope to then also attract and, and stimulate other outside investors to join us because all of a sudden the company which was having trouble struggling to get its its funding done now has two million or three million dollars so it has a clear path to that extension of its runway um you look at how we've done this we've deployed in the past 50 investments in oc50 in periods of six four in five months, and we did that without a war pushing us. So we believe very much so that we can do this kind of a, a project with great results, great investments, and hopefully great returns without carry and without management fees you know, for our investors. Um, we are being aided in this effort by a broad group of people, and this is just an initial list. I think this list is going to double, triple, and more grow. Uh, people like Ron Fisher uh, of uh, SoftBank, Izhar you met, Jennifer from the Proof Fund, Jim Scheinemann, who was the seed investor at Zoom, which we're using right now and runs Maven Ventures. Wendy Singer, who really was the uh, key person putting together Startup Nation Central, longtime figure in the Israeli uh, tech ecosystem. Steve Krauss, a GP at USVP, is uh, full disclosure, an old friend of mine from high school, but an amazing venture capitalist. Richard Anton, formerly uh, of uh, uh, the uh, really the major venture funds in England and now the GP at Ox. Uh, Mark Gazit from Theta Ray. Steve from a great heartland investor uh, called Refinery and Bruce Tarragon who's with us today. So without any further ado, I'm gonna stop my share and we're gonna bring up Bruce. To, uh, actually, I'm gonna, before we bring Bruce, I'm gonna turn it back to Kaylee so that he can talk a little bit about the fund. Uh, I'm sorry, our investment committee and, uh, and the fund uh, details. So Kaylee? Yep, with, with pleasure. As you can see on the screen, our investment committee is uh, made up of uh, the following individuals. We have John Medved, who's been leading the Aircraft Investment Committee, together with Andy Kay, our president and CIO. Um, the fund will also have on the IC, Liat Sverdlov, an investment partner, Ron Stern, who's our general partner and head of portfolio management, Josh Wolf, our chief operating officer, Alon Tal, 
who is a partner in SVP leading our investor relations department, and Dr. Hassan Dewan, our chief innovation officer. I just wanted to note that th this team basically encompasses a leadership of our crowd as a platform with you know, taking into consideration all the different uh, facets of the organization, you know, the, uh, the investment side and uh, the operation of the platform as a platform with the innovation side represented, you know, by Dr. Dewan. Um, this, this is an investment committee that has also led um, many of the investments on the platform and for other funds, uh, and we're big believers in this team. In addition to that, we can we can move move one slide further, right? And what we see here is basically the main terms of the fund. As John mentioned, it's a fifty million dollar fund. It could go higher depending on uh, the demand. The fund is domiciled in British Virgin Islands (BVI). Um, our crowd general partner LP, which is the GP of all of our special purpose vehicles and fund vehicles uh, and feeder feeder vehicles. Um, so it's basically a, a BVI partnership. Um, our crowd general partner is actually Cayman, but the fund will be based in BVI. The fund duration is 10 years with the possibility of two additional one-year extensions, as is very standard in, in, in VC. The investment period is actually something that is not typical. As Sean said, the idea is to bring liquidity to the ecosystem in a rapid pace. Six months is very, very quick. The, the questions that are uh, amassing on the on the uh, on the Q and A, a lot of them have to do with the with the point of how is Aircred going to be able in such a short period of time to deploy fifty million dollars of capital into fifty companies? And and the answer is we have a lot of experience doing this. Aircred in the past has put together a franchise of fund products called Aircred Fifty, which is basically a fund that invests in the next fifty companies that come to the Aircred platform. In, in some of the um, uh, vintages of this franchise, we've actually been successful in deploying capital in as, in as low as six months. So the idea will be to have the investment committee meet many times, sometimes two, three times a week for extended sessions with the idea of bringing as many investments to the committee and obviously doing all the diligence needed and all the work uh, in the background needed for that committee to move things quickly. And we believe that we're able to do that. The investment target is 50 plus eligible companies. Geographical focus, obviously, Israel. In terms of fees, there are no management fees and no carried interest. We just we we will be taking a 1% upfront organizational expense fee, which basically is supposed to cover the expenses of uh, setting up the fund uh, and administrative um, you know, uh, a side of things. And the fund administration expenses above that 1% are pretty much at cost. I'm, I'm going to uh, introduce Bruce, who's another dear friend, Bruce Tarragon, who is the general partner of Blumberg Ventures. I think speaking to us today from New York, if I'm not mistaken, with the picture behind your head, it could be San Francisco. It's real. It's real and it's New Bruce, York. Bruce, we can't, can't hear you. It's real and it's New York. Can you hear me it's now? It's New York. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now I can hear you. I'm sorry. Um, so Blumberg, full disclosure, is a firm that I've known for decades. I've been a huge fan. Now we put our money where our heart is, and we are LPs in the Blumberg uh, funds. And we are big, you know, believers in what they do. They turn out to be not only good people, ethical people, leaders in the community, but they produce enormous returns. And they actually have been huge investors in Israel. In fact, I'm not sure if there's even any other fund that has invested consistently being headquartered in America in the Israeli ecosystem. So you know more about Israel than many Israelis for sure, certainly in terms of high tech. So Bruce, we'd love to hear some words from you about the situation that the ecosystem is in and your feelings about this initiative. Thank you. John, Kaylee, thank you. I, I first want to say, I know Izhar dropped off, but what a beautiful human being. And I'm humbled by his ability to be composed and talk uh, about his son and share with us everything. And uh, I've known Izhar as well when he was back at Canaan Venture Partners a few decades ago and uh, truly humbling. My wife, Michelle, and I were actually in Israel when the war broke out and uh, celebrating Friday night. 
Prague with many, many family. And then obviously, as we all know, October 7th hit and uh, uh, all, all of our family, I have two brothers, parents, and dozens and dozens of cousins. And many, many, many have been called, almost all of them have been called up and are either in the North or the South. So uh, this can't be more personal uh, for us as well. And uh, our hearts go out to so many of the folks um, on the ground that are struggling and, and, and dealing with things that are just uh, beyond human comprehension. Um, I, I would say we as, as Americans, and many of you, I assume, are American investors, you know, here, like, hey, what can we do? How can we help? What's the situation? Um, again, I've known John and his team for, for decades as well. And I, I know, John, this wasn't a solicitation for me, at least, and not the expectation, but I want to say that I personally feel I can't do enough. And um, Michelle and I personally, my wife, Michelle and I want to personally invest in your fund. I think, you know, Kolika vote for what you're doing. So count us in uh, for the fund and uh, however we could be supportive in addition to being an advisor as well, uh, number one. As John mentioned, we've been investing in Israeli technology at Bloomberg Capital for uh, 30 decades, 30 years, I'm sorry, for many decades and approaching, you know, 30 plus years. I've actually lived and worked in Israel and, and spent the bulk of my career, about 20 years in Silicon Valley as well. And I guess part of it is I want to communicate to all of you that are on this call the sense of, on the one hand, this has been a horrific situation, what we've all experienced over the last 30 days. But on the other hand, literally just in the last 30 days, while all of this is going on at Blumber Capital, we sold a fintech company for almost a billion dollars to a public uh, a Canadian company that's listed on the NASDAQ. And that is the core uh, backbone infrastructure and technology driving that company in the fintech space. We actually share with our crowd another company that is uh, has now crossed unicorn status north of a billion dollar valuation. And they're currently right now as we speak, closing a secondary round of financing at again, north of a billion dollars. We have another fintech company in our portfolio that right now, just in the last month, signed a term We have another fintech company that is actually, and all of this, by the way, I, I didn't rehearse this. All of this has happened literally in the last 30 days. We have another company that has multiple term sheets, sub a half a billion dollars to raise between 75 and $100 million uh, as well. We have, uh, as some of you may have seen just in the last few weeks, you know, Dig, Talent Security were acquired by Palo Alto Networks together for almost a billion dollars just in the last few weeks. So John alluded to it in some of his slides in the presentation, and, and our learnings and understanding is if you look historically over the last 50 years in venture performance, you really want to lean in when there is this you know, disconnect in the market. And so we've seen that uh, Israel is obviously the startup nation, incredibly resilient, but U.S. You know, buyer, we have another cyber company that's in the middle of closing a 15 to $20 million dollars. Uh, the startup nation, a number of those board meetings, we had board members in that were called up on reserve duty. And, and, and parenthetically, I'd say about 10 to 20% of our portfolio companies in Israel, their teams on the ground in Israel have been called up for reserve duty with, you know, 360,000 people being called up on reserve duty. And I would say that um, nonetheless, we had a number of board calls just last week with founders and entrepreneurs that were in bunkers that were serving in reserve duty. One was actually sitting in a tank one was actually doing technical diligence with a potential buyer while they were sitting, you know, on the border uh, and, and, you know, stepped off to the side. You think of these things and they're almost unfathomable for us as human beings. And I'm just amazed at the grit, the resilience, again, having been on the ground when the war broke out in Israel and there for a few weeks, meeting with my team in Tel Aviv, as well as all of our portfolio companies. By the way, today we have about two dozen uh, Israeli-based portfolio companies out of our total portfolio of Lumber Capital, about a third traditionally of our investments have been going into uh, Israeli technology. Many of those are U.S. companies. Many of those are global companies. We've been in communication, regular communication on a daily basis with all of our portfolio companies in Israel specifically now and urging them to communicate with their customers, with their prospective customers to reassure them 
that they are a global company, they have backup in Europe and the US, that they can still, you know, without missing a beat, if some of you are old enough on this call to remember, Intel developed the 386, the 486 Pentium chips. They did not miss one day of development in spite of multiple wars that they were going through. And then the other piece of it is, which is amazing, just in the last week, I was on a phone call with a few of our portfolio companies out of Israel and the companies that they're currently either, that are either interested in investing, buying or partnering with our portfolio companies. Here's just a short list. Sony, GE, Cox, Fidelity, Dell, Capital One, Northern Trust, Sophos, Liberty Mutual, FIS, Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan, PwC, Aruba, Virgin, Verizon, State Street, City. Literally, these are folks that we're in process with that are either investing into portfolio companies, acquiring or interested in acquiring, or partners or customers that are looking to further deploy the solutions from the Israeli startups. And these are conversations we've had just in the last week. So when I think about, and John, you touched on it as well, historically, you know, the first, the second Antifada, all the different wars, there's always the knee-jerk response and, and obviously uh, a logical, you know, a drop in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange and, and by extension, what's happening to some Israeli startups. But usually within just a, a, a few quarters, these companies bounce back and they're stronger, smarter, faster, and better than ever. So while I'm personally going to invest in your fund, John, um, and and I'm a Zionist, obviously, and we're doing everything we can to support the state of Israel. Selfishly, I actually think this could be one of your best performing funds because it's such a difficult time. And, and it was actually difficult even before the, the, the war in Gaza broke out, frankly, as you alluded to. These are very challenging times at a macro you know, level. You know, Interest rates have gone up and a number of investors have sort of retracted and are, are concerned and, and were you know, arguably in, in some recessionary types of markets. So all these macro events were going on before the war broke out in Gaza, but that compounds things. And again, so I think it will create even a greater investment opportunity for us. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. I'm going to ask you before we get to this really large amount of questions, which I don't think we've ever had in any <laughs> in a webinar. I think we hit a new record here with 36 questions. And I've been busy trying to answer some of them by writing, but I'm going to go over most of them because they're really good questions. Um, Bruce, I'm going to ask you some. That my questions won't be as good. But what do you attribute the special relationship between Silicon Valley and Israel, which you're a big part of, as well as, you know, to what degree is this uh, healthy and alive and where will it be, you know, uh, five or 10 years from now? And how is it affecting, you know, the Israeli ecosystem under war? What do you hear from your colleagues in the Valley? So listen, John, as you know, what happened 30 days ago in um, the South was unprecedented. And unlike anything I've experienced, in spite of all we've been through multiple intifadas and wars over the last you know, few decades, uh, I'm personally on a probably a half a dozen to a dozen WhatsApps with literally hundreds of investors and VCs and other sort of mini groups seeing how we can make a positive impact, whether it's by donating, which I would urge all of you to do. You know, literally it happens to be the Friday night before the war broke out. I was at the hotel in Jerusalem and sitting next to me was Eric Goldstein, the CEO of UJA. And, you know, we've collaborated on a number of fronts and and and, and they're amazing, you know, UJA, you know, in my opinion, what they've done. And, and they've raised, you know, hundred something million dollars in emergency funds that they're, they're deploying. So I think there's opportunity for all of us to really lean in like there's never been before. I, I remember the Yom Kippur War. I was probably about five years old and I was sitting in synagogue with my dad and my brothers. And I literally remember my dad going home and saying, we're not buying a couch. We're not taking a vacation. We are emptying out our bank account and we are supporting Israel. That's what this moment is. And I think to have, sorry, I get emotional, but to have your fund that, you know, this Israel emergency fund is unbelievable because I, I actually think we'll make money and, and that's not what any of us are even necessarily here to do. But I, I think this will be potentially one of your best performing funds, but to be able to support UJA, Leket, Shalva, Zaka, brothers and sisters, Magin David Adom, there are dozens of organizations 
And, and it's truly phenomenal. I've heard from many people how astounded they were on the ground in Israel. If it wasn't for the American support in the first few weeks and global support for the state of Israel, for soldiers, for the IDF, whether it was buying medical supplies, buying vests, buying knee pads, buying tape, flashlights, and then and then helping people move from the south. Uh, Project Selena is something my partner, Yod Fatz, is, has leaned into and is heading up, moving over a thousand people from the south, helping them relocate. Half of them are children, buying them, you know, toys and food and, and managing. We haven't even gotten into the mental needs, you know, PTSD for so many folks that they're going through. So the need is tremendous. It, it, and I think rational people across the globe and, and many of the, 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 the WhatsApps that I'm on are unconditionally supportive, whether it's Silicon Valley or, you know, New York or Canada, the outpouring of love and support. I've seen myself, portfolio companies are getting from customers, partners, frankly, I would say the people that matter. It's very disturbing what's happening on social media. It's very disturbing, you know, the squad. It's very disturbing the some of the negative, you know, sentiment on college campuses. You know, as an example, I think on social media, on TikTok specifically, it's 30 to one pro-Palestinian versus pro-Israel. So many of us are trying to combat that behind the scenes. And many of you, I'm sure on this call, are doing things and can influence. So there's so much work to be done, but to stay optimistic, 80 to 90% of the people that matter, you know, President Biden to his credit, you know, Mayor Adams here in New York, you know, uh, I was just in synagogue, you know, Governor Hochul was unconditional, unequivocal, you know, traveled to Israel. Her father died while she was in Israel and, and her support of Israel has been phenomenal. And so the that vast majority of the people that matter, of the dollars that matter, are supporting and are with you uh, in this time of difficulty. And and so I think, you know, John, it's almost, I saw you sigh and take a deep breath. I think we should focus on that, not all the negative, not all the hate, and we have to combat that as well. But um, I think we, the you know American diaspora, need to lean in, need to step up and support. And this product that you're offering now is unique, is special, is timely, is essential. And, and that's what we're here to do, because really nothing else matters. And if the technology ecosystem in Israel suffers and gets marginalized, then they've won the war. Hamas has really won the war. We cannot let that happen. You're on mute, John. We will, we will not let that happen, Bruce. We will not let that happen. And uh, really, thank you for being here. I am now going to try the impossible. We never go over, and I hope this is not the first time, I'm going to try to lead you in a massive, quick answer of 36 questions. Here it goes. How many of the 50 companies in the fund that uh, we will invest in have already been identified? And my guess is probably a half to two thirds. I will get more detailed answers later. How many of them uh, have our crowd already invested in previously? And that depends on how many people like Bruce who are working on our uh, investment uh, advisory committee can bring us new deals. We want to help all the companies that we can and not just our own, but uh, we have a lot of companies of our own that, that are uh, worthy and make good investments, but we will pro we'll seek at least a 50-50 you know, uh, balance if we can, but that depends on how good we are at sourcing outside. And now go back to the Q&A list. Uh, why are global investments been down? What are the key factors affecting this? Well, that's a whole seminar. Let's just say that things were so way up, they had to come down. The, the COVID uh, digital bubble burst and uh, things went down and now they're coming back. What's the track record of our crowd VC? The best uh, uh, proxy for that relative to this fund is OC50. You can see those data on our website. Uh, if you're this anonymous attendee will write us, we'll send you that in writing. And the record of the current team, uh, you know, as a as a team are effective at, at our crowd 50. Is profit potential a second criteria in determining companies to invest in? No, it is the primary uh, criteria. We wanna build monster companies that will generate that 30% of Israel's tax revenues come from high tech. So we need tax revenues. Okay, we gotta pay for all this. And we need to do it by creating profit, which you'll get 
and that we will uh, do that. Um, when, what is the risk of a short runway? And uh, when will you know future uh, uh, commitments be uh, uh, brought to bear? So if you look at uh, short runways or are, are, are typically three months, four months, when a company is really getting its back against a wall, we want companies to have one year, 15 months, ideally two years, okay? But they need to have time to breathe, to plan, to go after the things that make sense for their business and not be worried about existential uh, danger. Um, if we go down here, we're gonna have to go down. Oh, okay, um, we're seeing if the war continues into the next year, how will this impact your strategy deploying capital in the six months? Uh, and uh, by the way, the, the answer is we'll have additional funds. Okay, we're going to deploy within six months. If the war continues, God forbid, we'll have another one. And are many of the founders employees fighting in the war? The answer is absolutely they are because a lot of the uh, tech companies have young people. As a matter of fact, about 10 to 20%, but the tech companies are continuing to produce really good things. Uh, despite that, and there's a lot of redundancy and, and, and uh, people stepping up and doing multitasking. Please confirm there'll be no fees at all during the entire life of the fund, which I understand is 10 to 12 years. You've got this now on record. This has been recorded. No fees, management, no carried interest during the life of this fund. What's the minimum amount to invest? $50,000. Is that correct, Kelly? I did. Okay. Uh, how much is our crowd investing? Typically, it's 1% of uh, as a GP in everything that we do on our crowd. Curious, uh, how do the come? Okay, somebody who's invested in these companies paying fees, how will they feel now about other people coming in and not paying fees? Guess what? More money coming into the companies helps the companies, and they should put more money to work in the fund, okay, where they won't have to pay fees. Uh, don't get used to this, okay? This is not something we want to train you. This is because it's wartime, okay? Uh, how much manpower will be available to staff these startups? Plenty. There is a lot of young people here, and they work hard and will be fine. When will the first liquidity event occur? Uh, when is the last event projected? Well, the first one, let's hope it happens in a matter of months. You heard from Bruce about all the great things that are going on in the uh, ecosystem. The last event would be at the end. The resilience study didn't go back to the Yom Kippur War. Okay, how resilient was the Israeli economy then? That is a great question, Phil. I'll have to go back and study that. I was here as a 17-year-old during that period, and I didn't study the equ economy, but I'll get back on it. Um, Israeli startups need Israeli shekels more than they need foreign currency. Uh, guess what? We do well, okay, uh, because we get our money in dollars and we turn it into shekels. So actually, with the shekel where it is, we're in good shape. Uh, it's not a shekel fund, it's a dollar fund. When will the closing occur? We're going to be doing uh, the first closing, I hope, when there's uh, 10 million or so in the fund, and that could be in a matter of uh, a week or two, I hope. We're gonna move quickly here, and I hope the fund is fully subscribed. Will we close the fund once we reach a certain amount? Um, we're right now targeting 50, it might go above it. We'll see, a lot will depend on you. What are projected returns on a 50K investment? Look, we look for double digit returns. If you look at our OC50 funds, even after the downturn in the market, many of them are showing 12, 14% kinds of returns after fees and carry. Guess what? No fees and carry. So I'd hope that in this case, we can get into the high teens or 20%, do the arithmetic on what it would do over a period of time. Does the government invest via grants or do they invest in equity? They give us uh, grants. The government doesn't take equity. How many competing funds are being raised? There are several initiatives, a couple of them already have announced, and uh, we're cooperating with some of them. Uh, nobody is as large at the moment in terms of their announced amount as we are, and we 
salute them. Every uh, group who wants to go raise money for Israeli companies and not take fees on doing it, they're my friends. And I want to you know, tell them thank you. Will there be firm rules for funding criteria? Uh, yes, we're, we're, we're quite good at making rules and we don't try to break them too often, but we do break them occasionally. Will the fund aim for industry diversification? We are the most diverse funder. We're doing cybersecurity, food tech, space technology, uh, obviously artificial intelligence, healthcare. We're very well diversified. Uh, on the matching and amplification, is that a requirement or aspiration? That's an, uh, a requirement. If there's no matching, we're not doing it. Uh, is the 1% organ paid upfront? No, it's not annual. It's a one-time 1% paid upfront. Hopefully the diversity of the advisors and voting members improves. Yes, we hope so too. If you know any great women or uh, you know other diverse uh, people you would like to join us, send me an email, I want it, okay? And uh, what tax statements we give K-1s, and I wanna tell you that we are very proud that this year we got out over 30,000 K-1s by March 15th. So this is, you know, we're good at K-1s. Um, uh, hopefully, let's see if we can get this to move down a little bit. The mechanism to set valuations, Okay, we are very careful about valuations. It's, a, it's not an answer I can give you in a few seconds, but it's based usually in terms of revenue, uh, producing companies on a multiple of revenue, depending upon how steep the curve is for their, their growth. But for companies in which we've already invested, where we have a conflict of interest, we will end up doing what are called convertible notes or safes, whereby we won't set a valuation, but we will get a discount to a future valuation where an external investor investing a real amount of money will set the price, okay? Uh, we will invest in companies in which employees are actively on reserve duty. The answer is yes, okay, we are going to do this. How resilient do we expect the ecosystem to be uh, if another horrible active uh, fighter joins the uh, a war against Israel. Uh, we will be resilient no matter what happens. Israel is here to stay. We are a strong country. And uh, we, are, we are hoping that the, uh, the expected runway extension is going to be enough. Typically, the rebound starts anytime from 60 to 90 days after the war starts. And we've already seen it now in the last couple of days in the stock market, one month after the war. And we are, we are confident that this runway will be enough for the companies. We are going to uh, invest in Israeli companies, which have a big bulk of their employees and not just a piece of technology in Israel. Uh, and as a European-based private investor, uh, if you don't like BBI, be in touch with us. If we have enough Europeans, we have built structures in Luxembourg and other places that are more friendly to you. But uh, BVI is where this initial fund is being set up. Uh, are we seeing every opportunity out there at this time? No, we, we miss uh, opportunities. Is 50 million really enough? Absolutely not. I call upon someone here to you know, invest five or 10 million. What's the very minimum investment to invest? It's $50,000. Our Subscription documents are actually written mostly in real English and not too weird. You can see them on our website and they are available on DocuSign. And in terms of what's required for new investors, our onboarding process is pretty straightforward. What happens after six months if there's still huge opportunities? We might extend the investment period if we haven't deployed the money. I hope not. I hope we have another fund. Okay, the uh, you said, you know, the fees, if if the war is still going, another fund like this will be the same. If the war is not still going, okay, we will uh, try to make sure that we have maybe a follow-on with uh, reduced fees, but we need to start making some money at some point. Uh, we are happy to uh, take taxable and IRAs and figure out a way to get around the 50K minimum together. 
And I think that I've run out of time. Uh, double digit returns, by the way, are annual IRM. It isn't double digit returns over a 10 year period. It's a double digit return after, uh, you know, in each year, God willing. And uh, when is the final closing? Uh, it, within 90 days, we're gonna get this thing wrapped up for sure. Uh, will the deals being offered be offered via preemptives to existing OC investors? And the answer is yes, to the extent that we have existing deals. Uh, latest return comps, again, go to our OC50. And again, we're not trying to double returns over 10 years. If you look at, you know, if you get 20% a year over 10 years, do the arithmetic, it's quite, it's quite impressive, especially without fees and carry. How do startups apply? They send it to uh, dealflow at arcrowd.com. Send me an email or contact your arcrowd person uh, or simply you know, right to uh, investor services at our crowd. Uh, any tax advantages to this fund for U.S. investors, uh, other than the fact that you're not taxable in Israel? No. How much will dilution affect funding for new rounds? Hard to tell. That's part of life when you invest in venture capital. Uh, wow, this is unbelievable. I have to end, I think, at, at this point, okay, because I actually violated my commitment to be done within an hour. You guys keep on asking questions. So we will turn this list of questions into a uh, FAQ and get it out to everybody. I just wanna really thank this incredible group of people who have showed up tonight to be here on this webinar. Both uh, Bruce Tarragon, your words and comments were amazing. Yizar Shai is off with his family. My partner, Kaylee Chill, has done a great job of moderating, and all of you who have stuck with us here and provided these great questions. We look forward to working with you on the fund. Please join us in the Israel Resilience Fund. That's it for tonight. Thank you. And thank you. Kaylee, thank you.